Winfield Scott, he was also involved in the 1832-33 crisis. He was the commander of federal forces in Charleston Harbor at the time. A pretty sensitive place in 1832-33. And what Scott had done was he had encouraged the men of his command to interact, to engage with the people of South Carolina, to assure them of the goodwill of the federal government. And he believed that had resolved the crisis. Because he believed you take a hard stand once the shooting starts. The most important thing is to not have the first shot fired. But once the shooting started, then everything will lose control. And so you've got these two men using lessons of history from this, separate lessons from the same episode in shaping their thinking on this issue. Now, when Scott is asked, how long do you think your anaconda will take? About two years at a minimum. Francis people, okay, Blair family, how long is yours going to take? Well, we got troops for 90 days. It'll be done by 90 days. Well, what decision do you think a president is going to choose, given a two-year uncertain and the argument for something that'll be quick, dirty, and get it done with quick? He goes with the Blair family's uh, suggestions, and he orders an advance on what's going to be the Confederate forces at Manassas Junction. The man chosen to command it, a man by the name Irvin McDowell. McDowell, prior to the war, in 1861, was a major serving on the staff in Washington, D.C. He impressed people around the Capitol with his hard work organizing troops for defending the Capitol. And more importantly, McDowell is from the state of Ohio. And that's important because in the, normally the choice of, of commanders, you would expect the Secretary of War to play a key role in that. Well, Lincoln's first Secretary of War was a man by the name of Simon Cameron. Simon Cameron was appointed as a political favor, not because he had any confidence or interest in the military, other than seeing how many contracts he could funnel to his friends in Pennsylvania. Uh, the story about Cameron was when he's finally relieved from the Secretary of War, Lincoln gives him an appointment to become ambassador to Russia, and one politician says at the time, somebody better send a telegram to the czar Tell him Cameron's coming so he'll know to lock up his valuables at night. But because Cameron is more concerned with the patronage aspects of the, and not so much who's in command and what they're doing, the Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, plays a very assertive role here. And that's also because of Chase's personality. There's a story about Chase that someone said, you know, I like this Chase guy. He's a very good man in many ways. But his theology is unsound. He thinks there's a fourth man in the Trinity. Uh, but Chase plays an important role here in making sure that McDowell, an Ohioan, gets appointed to an important command. And this is going to be command of the forces that are going to be organized to conduct operations against the Confederate forces that are organizing at Manassas Junction, less than 20 miles from the capital. Uh, now, we got our Jomanian steps. Have we agreed on the character of the war? Well, not between Scott and Lincoln. Scott's to, Scott goes along because of the president orders. He goes along with it. But he's still not crazy about this idea of a quick victory. But he is subordinate, and he watches, and watches, helps McDowell prepare for this campaign. Next step is the theater of war. Well, if you're going to do this thing quickly with the 90-day troops, you're not going to go all the way down to Alabama. Fortunately, the Confederates have done you the favor and that they have moved their capital to Richmond. And so, you study the theater of war, they establish their capital at Richmond, you've established yours at Washington, thus, the, sec the next step is taken care of, choose your base of operations. They're going to be basing out of Richmond, you're going to base out of Washington, so naturally, the zone of operations is going to be the region between Washington and Richmond. So, what are you going to do when you leave Washington? Where are you going to find the Confederates? Well, the Confederates have established a defensive position at a place called Manassas Junction. And you see it up here on the map where Beauregard's block is right there. Uh, Manassas Junction is critical uh, because these armies, the size of these armies makes it necessary that you have railroad logistical support. And coming out of Washington, the main southward going uh, railroad is the Orange and Alexandria Railroad that leaves Alexandria. Um, so 
almost by the logistical, logistics dictate where McDowell's army is going to come out of. So they're going to follow the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, leaving Alexandria and Washington. Uh, out in the Shenandoah Valley, you've got another critical area. Up at Harper's Ferry, you've got an important railroad junction. So that is naturally going to be the base of operations for another federal force commanded by Robert Patterson. To oppose the Federals in these two areas, the Confederates divide their forces. 22,000 men under PGT Beauregard around Manassas Junction, and about 11,000 men under Joseph Johnston out in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, the Federals outnumber the Confederates in the theater of operations, but the Confederates have a critical advantage of interior lines. If they are able to use the Manassas Junction Railroad, Manassas Gap Railroad, that links the Orange and Alexandria Railroad with the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and that's the reason Manassas Junction is the initial point for Beauregard's defense, is because of that railroad junction there. Just uh, and distance from it, you've got a convenient defensive position behind Bull Run, so that naturally becomes Beauregard's defensive line for protecting Manassas Junction and the ability to reinforce Johnston or himself as deemed necessary. Now, on July 16th, McDowell's army of 33,000 men begins marching out of Washington. Before he leaves, McDowell arranges with Scott and says, you know, we know about Johnston's forces out there. Scott assures McDowell that Patterson, Robert Patterson's forces, will operate in a way to hold Johnston's forces in the Shenandoah Valley so that they cannot reinforce Beauregard. Problem with Patterson's forces, Patterson has 26 regiments. Of them, 19 are scheduled to go home during the week this campaign takes place. So as you might understand, Patterson's going to conduct his operations with a good degree of caution. And because he does so, the Confederates are going to be able to order Johnston to leave the valley and go and reinforce Beauregard's forces at Manassas. The order comes on July the 17th, the day after McDowell's forces march out of Washington. Now, in the legend of the first Manassas campaign, a lot of attention is given to these femme fatales who lived in northern Virginia and rode in their hoop skirts and everything like that to ride to the gallant Beauregard and advise him that the Redcoats were coming, or you know what they would consider them the Redcoats, right? That they, that these, that they rode to Beauregard's headquarters and told him of these, the federal forces coming, and because of these gallant ladies of the South, the Confederacy was saved. Great story, okay? However, Beauregard did not need women riding in hoop skirts to tell him that the Yankees were coming. It was in all the newspapers, all the federal newspapers. In any case, 33,000 men marching out of Northern Virginia is going to be pretty hard to hide and conceal in any case. So there's that romantic story there, but the, the reality is the Confederates were aware that McDowell would come out at some point. The timing was just a matter of reading Northern newspapers and watching what happens in Alexandria. And when they find out McDowell is actually marching, the orders go to Johnston to reinforce Beauregard at Manassas. And essentially, the Battle of Manassas is going to be a race. Okay? And you've got the lines of operations up there, the Jomanian uh, ideas. They've both chosen their lines of operation to get there. McDowell using railroads. His first effort is to try to encircle a small forward force that Beauregard has at Fairfax Courthouse. This fails. Uh, for because of the inability to keep operational security and the fact that McDowell's troops are brand new. They don't march very effectively or very efficiently, and it's pretty easy. To, and Beauregard's initial plan, excuse me, McDowell's, is a bit complicated for them to in, effectively execute. So Beauregard's able to fall, roll back his forces from Fairfax Courthouse to Manassas Junction. Johnson's forces are going to be able to leave the valley, and essentially it's going to be a race on the Battle of Manassas. Can McDowell defeat Beauregard's forces before all of Johnston's guys arrive? Um, and this comes to the final step in Jomini strategy approach, attack or maneuver to compel the enemy to retreat. McDowell comes up with a pretty good battle plan. The idea is to feint at the Confederate position center and try to maneuver around uh, the Confederate left. Um, initially, things start out pretty well, but as Clausewitz says, it's luck, fog, and friction. There's all kinds of problems with McDowell's efforts to try to execute what is a sound plan on paper. 
And with all these problems, there's delays in the marches, uh, there is hesitancy, there's uncertainty, and this provides the Confederates time to get the last of their reinforcements from the valley to Manassas. Um, and as a consequence, the Confederates are able to gain an advantage of the battlefield of Manassas. Uh, McDowell orders his men to fall back towards Centerville, but then as his men are retreating towards Centerville, the Confederates manage to get an artillery cannon in a position to fire on the bridge, the one bridge that everybody's got to funnel through, overturns a wagon, the Federals panic, and then next thing you know, instead of an orderly retreat to, to Centerville, you've got a panic flight back to Washington, D.C., which some of the observers, ho, 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 called the time that tried men's souls because the Federals ran back to Washington so quickly. Um, and so you have this defeat at this battle, um, and when it's over, McDowell is going to be retained in an important command, but placed over him is going to be George Brenton McClellan, who has won some victories out in West Virginia and is essentially going to be the central character of the next phase of the, po of the war after Manassas. But that's about how far we've got to in this lecture. I see, I want to say we've got some time here for questions. And so, what are your questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, good day, Doctor. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Shalhoub from the Canadian Army. Mm -hmm. What was the Confederate grand strategy? Because we know the northern one was Anaconda. What did the South try to achieve militarily? The, the, big, the big objective is don't lose, okay? Um, we've kind of started with kind of this home field advantage. We've declared our, our independence. Don't lose. Hold on to what we've got. Uh, what the Confederates are going to develop after Manassas is largely a defensive approach to defending. Try to defend. Not, you don't necessarily need to defend every mile of frontier. You just need to be able to block the areas where railroads and rivers come into your, into your country. The Confederates undertake this as part of their strategy defensive approach. But in 1862, it's going to break down because it gives the Federals the initiative. And as the Confederates try to defend everywhere, you know, the old saying, you try to defend everywhere, you defend nowhere. They try to disperse their forces on too many points, and the Federals will pick and choose their lines of operations. They'll mass on them. In early 1862, the Federals win a series of victories. So in the summer of 62, the Confederates, with the Federals on the doorstep of Richmond and having gone deep into Tennessee, the Confederates adopt a more offensive strategy. Instead of trying to defend everywhere, they concentrate their forces into field armies and try to take the offensive. And instead of the Federals dictating the terms of operations, the Confederates try through offensive operations to dictate the terms of, of the campaign. And this, to a large extent, is going to be the strategy of the Confederacy going forward for the rest of the war. Largely defensive strategically, but taking the operational offensive. Again, for the reasons I said, have the initiative. You try to pick and choose where you're going to fight. And in Virginia especially, they're going to love going up in the Shenandoah Valley because going to the Shenandoah Valley in an offensive way will lead the Lincoln administration to release pressure on. So it's an offensive strategy after 62. Does that answer your question? OK, thanks, sir. But, but again, like all good strategists, they, they're reactive. They will, they will not try to impose a single prescriptive strategy, but they will try to take advantage in local areas um, when they can. Yes? Patterson advanced um, from Harper's Ferry toward Winchester, but as you can understand, if two-thirds of your army is getting ready to go away, you're going to be kind of very hesitant about it. Um, Johnston's cavalry under Jeb Stewart is going to put up a very effective screen, and that's going to further deter Patterson, and ultimately he's going to decide to fall back toward Harper's Ferry rather than, and he doesn't even get the intelligence that, that Johnston is leaving the valley. Um, he just does, again, Patterson is often, he gets a lot of criticism for his conduct out there, but if you understand the basic condition he's got with his troops, um, he didn't do the job he was doing, but he had, he had, these, he had serious problems of manpower. Um, I'm not trying to give excuses for him, but that, the basic problem was he advanced a little bit, ran to the screen, fell back, and didn't even pick up that Johnston had left the valley. Yes, sir. Of enlistments 
for the soldiers on the Confederate side. <coughs> Excellent question. The, Confederate, the Federals, their first call for troops are for 90 days because under the Militia Act, that's what Lincoln has authorization to do. Congress is not going to be in session until July, so Lincoln's got to start raising troops on the authority of this Militia Act. And there's also some suggestion that Lincoln may have raised 75,000 troops, hoping the Confederacy would say, uh, oh, you're really serious about this now, okay? You're really serious, well, maybe we'll rethink it. But of course, it didn't have that effect. The Confederacy, from the beginning, they begin doing one-year-long enlistments. Uh, and conse consequently, they're going to have a real crisis in early 62 when they, get, and they go to conscription, the first conscription act in American history. Uh, so that, that's the basic difference in the manpower there. Um, and that's going to have long-term effects throughout the war because the Confederates get an early start on mobilization. Um, and so they start developing a little bit better qualitatively early in the war than the North does. Of course, over time, the North will catch up qualitatively. They add the quality of the quantity, and it's going to eventually crush the Confederacy. That, that, yeah, okay, yes, sir. In, throughout your steps, uh, mm -hmm. two through eight, whatever it is, you yeah. say making a strategy. Mm -hmm. To me, what you actually are describing is operational planning and implementation. Why did you use the word strategy? Because that's the word Jomini uses, and that's why I had the asterisk definition up there. Because Jomini defined, well, he used the term strategy. We use the term operations. Strategy, of course, is the bigger Lincoln, Scott, should we invade? What measures should we use? How should we mobilize? What are our aims? Of course, aims are very important because you're trying to win back consent of the people of the South. And early in the war, the Lincoln administration strategically is trying to more conciliate the South by saying, we'll beat up your armies, but we'll be good to your people. And so because we're going to beat up your armies, you don't want to serve in their armies. And because we'll be cool with the people, the people aren't going to want to support the army. And he tries to undermine the Confederacy that way. It's so when that doesn't seem to have worked in 62 that they begin to move towards emancipation and harder policies. But yeah, you're exactly correct. Jomini uses the term strategy, what we term operations. Um, and again, he's writing primarily for generals. Um, this is how you conduct a successful campaign. Now, he says, you know, agree with your head of state on the, on the type of war you're going to be in. Oh. That doesn't provide much guidance. That just the, the assumption is once you've done that, sort of the head of, head of the, the head of government will keep with the politics, and then the general will then go take care of these steps and apply them using his military scientific knowledge. Uh, but yeah, Germany meant operation. Well, we would mean operations when he used the term strategy. And that's an important distinction when you're because the, the what strategy is, what the operations is, often ends up being very very confused in terminology. Yes, sir. Scott, him, Scott appears to have been a bit more perceptive than most that force, you know, you challenge the Confederacy and you fight them, they're going to accept the challenge. And even if you beat them, that doesn't necessarily mean they can be. I mean, in Missouri, it appears to be a perfect vindication of Lincoln. In Western Virginia with McClellan, it appears to be a vindication of Lincoln's thing. Union armies go into these areas, they defeat Confederate forces on the battlefield, and then they begin installing loyal governments that begin acting like loyal governments. Of course, under the surface, Missouri and uh, West Virginia are going to be headaches for the whole rest of the war because you've got the phase four operation, right? You've got to occupy and let these people know, we chased out this government you voted for before, now we're bringing in this new government, and you will accept that. And people oftentimes, sometimes, don't. Uh, so there, there, in terms of seeing how long, Scott, Scott's concern was rooted in a, his, his study of history. Um, the Civil War in Rome had destroyed the Republic. And he wrote in a very gloomy letter um, advocate, at, telling the Lincoln administration, really, you should endorse compromise policies that are being proposed. If it comes to a war, it's going to be a civil war. And there's nothing more dangerous for a republic than a civil war. And he says, even if we are able to bring them in, the cost of keeping the South in the Union, of occupation duties, of defeating their armies, is going to be worth far more than anything we could get out of them in terms of revenues or taxes or things like that. And it, he, he, said, he even throws the term, we may end up here. In order to undertake the measures needed to cross the Confederacy, 
you're going to have to have some kind of assertive, authoritative leader, which could easily blend into a protectorate or sort of a, C a Caesar situation. And that could be the, you, know, you might get them in, but you won't, you won't bring them back in happy. Um, and that was a lot, drove a lot of his idea behind the anaconda for economic sanctions and things like that. But, but few people were listening to Scott. Mm -hmm. right? Well, there were some people in the, in the North who did, but the American people back then were an impatient people back then. We all know today, you know, we're a lot more patient these days, okay? But back then, I mean, it was, it was, it was a, the politics at the time, they were divisive now, they were divisive back then. Uh, it, the, the, the passion that people have for politics in the 19th century, I mean, now we've got sports to take off some of our competitive juices. It has sometimes been said that politics was America's first national sport. I mean, people invested into politics the kind of passion that we disperse between politics and sports. They put it all into politics. So it is a very, very volatile, hard to get a hold on political, very passionate political system. And the thinking was, you know, this, this thing got ratcheted. We were in this war because the, the passions got ratcheted up. Scott's saying the first thing we need to do is calm those passions down. Do some kind of compromise. Do some kind of conciliation. But of course, the Lincoln perspective is the opposite. As I said before, you keep compromising, you keep giving in, you keep giving in, you keep giving in, you're just going to stir up the passions even more because people have learned that getting emotional pays. And so they're, they're this, they're, this, this shape, they're both are thinking of what is the problem we're trying to deal with here. Uh, it, it makes the, the war very, very complicated, um, a complicated conflict. Not that there are any real simple conflicts, but it makes the Civil War much more complicated than sometimes you get the impression. Yes, sir? So just to carry, carry this further, it appears that you're teaching out that uh, there was some wisdom or perspective of what Scott was advocating, mm -hmm. but of course it sounded like he was arguing for compromise and, and not getting, you know, getting passionate at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, again, it's you're trying to do a counterfactual. What if they had done the Anaconda plan? And there's some people afterwards say, after two or three years, they say maybe we should listen to Scott. But the argument for immediate action, a quick stand, appeared to be a logical stand. Like I said, in Missouri, it worked. And now we can we now know it didn't work so well because it left underlying problems. But the idea, but again, this idea that. You can win the victory. You can defeat the enemy quickly. You can shock and awe them, and then they'll collapse. That, I mean, that's, that, that's a very, very powerful, powerful pitch, as opposed to saying this gloomy guy says it's going it to last forever. You know, it, it's, and again, the, the, the nature of American politics, we got elections every two years. And for Congress, we got elections with the president every four years. You've got elections every, you got elections in, at the state level, which have an have a impact on. So you've constantly got this concern about the electoral, um, the electoral situation, and you've got editorials which are saying, stand up, be firm, be strong, be like Andrew. The, Andrew Jackson's image keeps on coming up in front of Lincoln, and Lincoln articulates it himself. When the people of Maryland proved troublesome in letting troops go through there, um, the governor of Maryland says to Lincoln, maybe you should not be sending more troops through Maryland. And Lincoln says, there's no Andrew Jackson in that. There's no strength in that. There's no respect. There's no decency in this. I'm going to send troops through the state of Maryland. So this picture that Jackson had stood up strong to these people, and since Jackson, we in the North have not. We did compromise in 32. We did compromise in 1850. We gave them this. We gave them that. We gave them the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And every time we think we've got them to the point where they'll, they say, Give us this and we'll behave. I mean, it's the Munich analogy, right? Which is, you keep giving in to people, and if you don't stand up straight right away, but if you stand up, if only you stood up firm earlier. Of course, then there's the World War I analogy, was if you jump in too fast, then you, get, then you end up fighting over some guy getting shot in the Balkans, right? So these, these two lessons of history, and so that's the, the challenge of trying to see what are the parallels that can inform our thinking, while also being sensitive to differences then and now that can also shape our thinking. Did that, that, that address? 
I kind of went on off in a tangent there. Scott retired as general in chief in November of 1861. Um, after, second, after first Manassas, George McClellan is called to Washington from, uh, from Western Virginia. And he takes command of the troops around, around Virginia, uh, around DC. Um, Winfield Scott is his senior officer. Abraham Lincoln is not the greatest respecter of the chain of command. Winfield, Abraham Lincoln goes to McClellan's house all the time to talk about stuff. Scott issues, says, goes, says to the Secretary of War, hey, he's supposed to work through a chain of command. Secretary of War issues orders saying that you must work through a chain of command, but Lincoln, Lincoln keeps going to McClellan's house. And McClellan begins viewing Scott as getting in the way of his plans of operations. Um, and he uses this frustration begins building in October about the failure to undertake operations again in Virginia. And McClellan tells the people who are upset about it, it's Scott's fault. So they begin going to Lincoln and, and they start saying, hey, it's time for the general to, re to resign and retire. Um, and, and in fact, there is this real, real serious sense of drift in the Union war effort from July of 61 till McClellan takes command because Scott really is not articulating strategy or policy. He's just kind of expecting to be respected for his office but not really carrying out the office very effectively. You got a situation going on in Missouri, you got a situation going on in Kentucky, but there's no real integration of the Union war effort. And that in Scott's age, finally in November 61, November the 1st, Scott steps down as General in Chief. McClellan is made General in Chief, takes his place and begins to impose that kind of order on the Union war effort. But there's a very problematic time in the Union war effort where there is really, no, Lincoln is still kind of burned from First Manassas, so he's not really being all that assertive. Um, Scott has been burned because he wasn't listening to First Manassas, and he's not being very assertive, and his age, and, he's, and, and so it's a real problematic period in the Union war effort afterward. Yes? So you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the armadillo. Yeah. Sherman, Mr. Lincoln, Sherman's uh, uh, warning mm -hmm. of, of the North's power versus the South, and, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it played out for the Civil War. One could argue during the Revolutionary War we should have made the same argument against the British. Mm -hmm. It's too powerful. Vietnamese against America during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, Spanish against the French. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? So if we're, if we're learning from it, what's the difference in how the North, and, and I would throw out my thought process mm -hmm. is you start to see a change when Sherman goes across the South and you look at the newspaper articles mm -hmm. and, and the governors wanting to pull their forces back. So if, if looking at that, what's the difference between those and, and how the Civil War played out? Yeah, with the six seconds we got left. Uh, differences, again, the, the, there are differences, similarities, analogies. Uh, the Confederacy um, ultimately decides overwhelmingly to pursue a conventional strategy against the North in a war of exhaustion. In a conventional war of exhaustion, Napoleon can't win a conventional war of exhaustion. The Germans in World War II can't win a conventional war of exhaustion. Um, however, those other ones, well, the American Revolution, the um, Vietnam, you have a much more, an irregular force, which is a much bigger component of strategy. There are irregulars in the Confederacy, but there's no real effort to incorporate it into the overall strategy. In fact, Richmond very much does not like irregular warfare. And much of this is rooted in the fact that they're defending a slave society. And if you start having irregular warfare, in a, and again, you still have the same situation in the American Revolution. Um, but if you have irregular warfare in a very hierarchical society, I mean, the Confederates, the Southerners are seceding to preserve a society that is hierarchical, that's deferential, that's very traditional in its way of doing things. Um, if you start, part of guerrilla warfare works is if the other guy's army comes into your neighborhood. Well, if Union armies come into a Confederate neighborhood, slavery is going to be, as we're going to see during the war, slavery begins to fall apart. And if you're going to adopt a strategy, that's going to lead to slavery falling apart. And I'm not saying the whole war is about slavery. Or, but if you, if you, you to adopt a strategy in which th that is going to have slavery fall apart, that is going to be unacceptable to Southerners. Um, and you see what happens when Northern armies start going to the South, 
The slaves start running away, even before the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and so to adopt the guerrilla methods would have required such a different mindset on the, on the part of the Confederates. Of course, if they'd had the mindset to adopt a guerrilla strategy, they would have not had this, it, would, it was rooted in the slave society. If they hadn't had the slave society, then they probably wouldn't have succeeded in the first place, so we're not really talking. So, so there's big differences in the overwhelmingly conventional approach the South takes for compelling strategic reasons um, and the fact that there are large irregular forces playing a role in, in those wars. Because both war, all these are wars of exhaustion, which will come down to who has the will and ability to sustain. And it can be argued that if you look at the sectional conflict as a war of exhaustion, Ultimately, the South does prevail in a certain sense. They don't get an independent confederacy, but they do get to determine the terms with which their society will be organized after slavery has been abolished, one in which there are severely circumscribed civil rights for African Americans. Um, power will be in the hands of the same sort of people who had power before the war, and they've worked out a labor relationship which is close enough to slavery for Southerners to accept. So there's an argument that the South lost the war of exhaustion for the, for the Union. They gave up the Confederacy because they said independent Confederacy wasn't worth this destruction of our society, this kind of guerrilla conflict. But Reconstruction, determining the terms of home rule once we're established in the Union, that is worth conducting guerrilla operations. And the argument is you know, the Ku Klux Klan and the guerrilla forces did win Reconstruction. Okay. So that's, that's one of the reasons we're trying to get more of Reconstruction into the curriculum at the Staff College, as opposed to you know, a lot of the railroads and conventional stuff of the Civil War, because it does have that, it's, you don't say, they did this in the Civil War, we'll do it this time, but it does have you think, just like General Ripper said, you won't be walking onto that battlefield for the first time. You, if you, do, you, you have seen it if you studied the war in Missouri. Okay, with that, I know uh, all of you have to get back to work this afternoon. And we want to very quickly uh, thank Dr. Raffius uh, for being our first speaker. And so we have a little thing for you to carry back uh, to command thank staff you, college there. And you did a really good job, thank and we appreciate that. And one quick administrative note, uh, our next presentation is going to be the introduction of the first volume in our Defense Acquisition History Series. We'll have the author here talking about that, Dr. Elliot Converse. And also we'll have uh, here a former Undersecretary of Defense for at &L, Dr. Jack Gansler, and also Dr. Roy Wood out of the Defense Acquisition University. And they'll be talking about uh, how we stood up initially in the first 15 years, 45 to 1960, uh, the acquisition process in the Department of Defense and tried to bring all the services together in that respect. That's on the 10th of May at 1130. And then in June, we'll be back to the Civil War and have uh, Robert Crick here, uh, an excellent speaker uh, and a very knowledgeable person talking about uh, Stonewall Jackson in the Valley. And so we hope to see you at future events. Thank you very much for attending today.